Welcome to Reading the Room, a literary podcast featuring author interviews and discussions with bookish content creators. I am your host, Jalen, also known as The Bar in the Bookcase on YouTube. Today I am joined by one of my all-time favorite writers, Lauren Euler, author of Fake Accounts, to join me to talk about Mating by Norman Rush, winner of the 1991 National Book Award. The book came on my radar because of Fake Accounts, Lauren's debut novel, and in the acknowledgments, she references Mating by Norman Rush, and I also saw some of her tweets about the book, and from there I had to read it. And in doing so, I figured I could also ask Lauren to come on the podcast to give me her thoughts on why she loves this book so much, and how much or how little of this book was an influence on Fake Accounts. We are getting into spoilers, but I will say... Even as we discuss the ending of this book, I really don't think mating is one that can be spoiled. I think our chat today serves as a really interesting introduction into what's going on in this book, and I don't think your read will be lessened if you listen to this podcast first, but I wanted to give the full disclosure in advance in case anyone is sensitive to spoilers. So in case you are not familiar with Mating by Norman Rush, this book asks the question, is love between equals possible? This modern classic is a delightful intellectual love story that explores the deepest canyons of romantic love, even as it asks large questions about society, geopolitics, and the mystery of what men and women really want. The narrator of this expansive novel of high intellect and grand passion is an American anthropologist at loose ends in the South African Republic of Botswana. She has a noble and exacting mind, a compelling waist, and a busted thesis project. She also has a yen for Nelson de Noon, a charismatic intellectual who is rumored to have founded a secretive and unorthodox utopian society in a remote corner of the Kalahari, one in which he is virtually the only man. Also, I have been raving about fake accounts for years now. Um, we talk about how the book's been out for almost three years, which is wild to say, but it's one of my all-time favorite novels. So I highly recommend reading these two together if you are not familiar with either work. Just make sure you read these books because they're both great and <laughs> Lauren Euler is incredible. So also near the end of this interview, I asked Lauren a little bit about her piece in Harper's Magazine, which came out this year. And I didn't really give a preface or introduction as to what I was talking about. So the piece is called I Really Didn't Want to Go by Lauren Euler in Harper's. Highly recommend you add that to your reading list as well. It's a fantastic essay, and it was fun to think about that essay in relation to mating as well. Without further ado, let's get into the discussion with Lauren Euler about Mating by Norman Rush. Lauren, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about Mating by Norman Rush, a book that came on my radar because of you. And so I had to ask you to come on and talk to me about it because I'm very fascinated by this book. So first question for you, what are your like high level thoughts on mating? How many times have you read it? And has your opinion changed? Sure. So I just reread it. So I've only read it twice, uh, but I just reread it in March um, because uh, everybody was talking. I wanted to reread it, but I was like working on another book and I was quite busy. I don't know. So I was just reading short stuff. Um, and then I kept recommending it to people. So I recommended it to uh, one of my boyfriends. I recommended it to a couple of friends uh, and I kept getting into these situations where like they would be like, what should I read? And then I was like, well, actually, this is the best book uh of the like one of the best novels of the 20th century so you should definitely read it uh and i love it so much um and my boyfriend read it last year and he was like you changed my life uh this book changed my life i understand everything so different now um and then i gave it to another friend uh in the spring and we were all at this rave and it was like two in the morning and we had to spend like 45 minutes uh in the middle of the rave, like gushing about the book and talking about the ending and talking about all of our theories about the book. Uh, so everybody was just getting very enthusiastic about it again. So I reread it so I could talk about it. And I really got to reread it because I don't remember, I just basically don't remember anything, uh, including the end. end. Um, and the first time I read it was in 2018. So I was writing fake accounts at that time. And um, my friend Christian Lorenzen gave me a copy and he uh, suggested that he had read some of it. it, he had read it, but he actually had only read the first 80 pages, but then, so then I was like, I read it. I was like, this is amazing. And he was like, oh, I actually haven't read it. Um, but it really like fortified my approach in writing fake accounts, I think, um, because of the sort of rich language uh, and the sort of unashamedly intellectual um voice that the narrator has and the sort of like uh unashamed like personality that she has um and there are many things about it that we can talk about uh that i find like quote unquote inspirational as a writer um but yeah so when i read it it was so helpful and it has all these great um 
lines that aren't about the central plot, which is a, a graduate student um, pursuing uh, an older sort of beloved um, anthropologist in Botswana. But it has all these great lines and I like pulled one of them um, from just like a random sort of comment about the nature of the United States. Uh, and I and I gave it to the bad boyfriend character in fake accounts um, to basically play. He basically plagiarizes it and when he's sort of flirting with uh, the, the narrator, um, just like as a little joke. So those aren't really high level thoughts, but that's an introduction to, to my relationship to mating. So that's really interesting because as I was reading this, I, I came to it because of fake accounts. And so when I was reading it, I was like inherently thinking about like the tie maybe to <laughs> fake accounts because it does feel so like in conversation with it um, in terms of like inspiration and just like that voice, like you're saying, the high intellect that it kind of leans into. Um, and I have a couple of like points about the plot and just like what's going on in the book. But before we get into that, I'm just, I want to hear what you think about like the, I guess, I don't know, like Twitter discourse around like the resurgence in popularity for the novel. Um, there was recently a New York Times piece about how like younger readers are looking to the novel for an answers about the question of like, is true love possible or what have you. So I'm just, I've been seeing it more and more frequently. It did win the National Book Award. So it's like, it's been a prized novel. So what do you just think about like the resurgence of the book and what's going on there? Well, I think what's interesting is that it feels like a book that you hand to people that you have to hear about from word of mouth. Um, and that is the way that I heard about it. And it is a book that sort of literary people, by which I mean people who work in publishing and magazines uh, really love. And it's not hard to see why, but not necessarily, I think like that I, I participated in that piece and I talked to, I like the writer very much and I talked to her for an hour about mating. And I think like you can talk about the battle of the sexes with that piece like all day. But I think like part, like a huge part of the appeal of it is that it is a, a novel, like it's a real novel. There is a narrator, she's telling you a story, right? And she starts at the beginning and she gets to the end and she's talking about all of her motivations and there's a whole like amazing setting. It's just like every, it's, it's a real novel. And by which I mean, like it is not sort of um sparse spare spare was the the popular term for describing contemporary sort of minimalist novels um it's not like lyrical right like it's not like poetry like it's not memoiristic at all right it feels uh sort of old-fashioned even though it's actually like incredibly contemporary and that's another reason why i felt like it was a model for me writing fake accounts because it, it doesn't shy away from talking about um like at the time, contemporary uh, international affairs and political issues, right? In very specific language that people sometimes don't think of as novelistic, right? And I think a lot of um, lesser writers attempt to make their books timeless and in doing so, they actually make them just sort of boring. Um, so I actually think that that is a big reason why it's appealing. I think that there is like a hunger for um, the sort of, classic pleasures of novels which is like amazing pro style like really like layered characters like um setting and also like knowledgeability right um you can read this novel and like learn a lot about Botswana in the 80s <laughs> uh which is a, a strange thing right so I think those are all reasons now the battle of the sexes element right i do think that there's also we've seen for years uh this sort of very vocal feminist movement which was sort of perverted in a number of ways from the, by the internet right like there's a lot of like campy misandry like meme sort of stuff uh if you want to intellectualize it more there's this sort of hetero pessimist tendency whereby mostly straight women are like oh heterosexuality is so terrible blah 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 um, while still uh, having boyfriends or, or husbands and um, uh, like participating fully in heterosexuality. Uh, and I think that there is like a backlash against the sort of more superficial hypocritical aspects of that movement. And what's great about the book is that it's, she's not a passive woman. Like she's a very active, very intelligent, very purposeful woman who is entirely herself 
And the conflict that she faces in the book is that she's obsessed with this older man who is more successful than she is. She is so obsessed with him that, I mean, we're, we can say spoilers. This is a book club, so most people will have read it, yeah. So, so like the, the sort of first best part of the book, I mean, there's lots of best, but the first sort of amazing plot point in the book is that she literally crosses the desert by herself for a week to seek out this man uh, because she's like so obsessed with him but she allows that sort of obsession with a man to coexist with being very intelligent right and not sacrificing like aspects of her personality as she's trying to win him over right um and there are reasons why i can, I can sort of support that argument later uh if and when we talk about the ending but i think it's like you know, it's not hetero pessimistic, right? It's a model of what the book calls intellect. She, she's seeking, um, she's seeking intellectual love, was what she calls it in the book, um, and that is a sort of uh, a kind of love that is based on equality and reciprocity and fem feminism. And of course, there's the whole the sort of Sal, the the the, fem the feminist utopian colony that um, the man that she's pursuing, uh, Nelson Denoon runs which we can also talk about but feminism is also a theme but she's she's resisting sort of like that superficial kind of feminism that i think like people are turning against again now um that, that this was uh, a conversation in the 80s is perhaps something that people who've been talking about feminism on the internet should think about um because it's like in many ways much more sort of sophisticated than a lot of the conversations we have um in contemporary pop culture about feminism today or in you know the newspaper or whatever um but yes also i mean this is kind of i'm sure you're going to ask about this but another another thing to think about is that the novel was written by a man um and that's perfectly i have no problem with it i don't know any woman who has a problem with it uh so that's also something to think about because sort of in the recent past, in the feminist recent past, you couldn't have a novel about the female experience written by a man because it was like supposed to be essential and and blah, 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 blah. No one can understand you and your pain, um, which is just not true. And if you believe that no one can understand you and your pain, then you wouldn't write a novel. Anyway, uh, I've been talking too much, so now you can ask me a question. No, I mean, that's perfect. I, mean, I want to ask you about like, so you hit on a couple of things that are on my list. So. The first one being, I guess, I want to hop into kind of the pre-survivalist story of her <laughs> um, trying to get to Sal. And one of my favorite, I think my favorite scene in the book is the Victoria Falls scene in which she has this sort of like existential <laughs> break in crisis. And so one of my favorite quotes, it says, um, why was I this sad? I needed to know. I was alarmed. I had no secret guilt that I was aware of, no betrayals or cruelty toward anyone. On the contrary, I have led a fairly generative life in the time I've had to spare from defending myself against the slings and arrows. Remorse wasn't it. And she starts like walking closer to the edge of the falls. And then the thought came to me, if you had a companion, you would stay where you are. I stopped in my tracks. There was elation and desperation. Where was my companion? And then she kind of like snaps out of it and like leaves the falls. But I thought it was really interesting to kind of see her like moment of hysteria that she ends up like brushing off and kind of realizing that she wants this intellectual love that you were speaking of. And so what do you make of that scene and that kind of framing for the rest of the plot? Well, I think the beginning of the book is interesting, right? Because she's speaking, she's speaking very specifically as having gone through the whole experience already. And so she sort of knows and acknowledges that she's telling you the story from the beginning. And she makes a couple of comments at the beginning where she's like, no, 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 I'm getting ahead of myself. And this Victoria Falls scene that you're talking about quite early in the book, but it's in this little sequence where she's describing, I think, three men that she dated before she meets Danoon. And they're all hilarious in different ways. One of them is obsessed with hygiene. I think this guy that she goes to Victoria Falls with is a photographer, correct? I think so, um, yes. Yeah, and then there's something else, but they're all very funny in different ways. Um, and she is like she's like i don't want to talk about these guys i only want to talk about to noon but then she's like no no no, i have to um and she, but she, but she says something about how like he's the the deluge or something and she's still picking like picking leaves out of her hair and twigs and stuff from from the deluge um so she's trying to tell the story like in a, a sort of straightforward way but she's also acknowledging that her like of course, you're like, I wanted to seek a companion. And so then I got in the mood to seek a companion. 
um, which is a kind of a retrospective insight, right? Um, but at the same time, she's also sort of wayward when we meet her. The first, this first little section is called Guilty Repose, I believe is first chapter. Um, all of the chapters in the novel have quite funny, little ironic um, titles. Uh, and she's in Guilty Repose because I think she's like 30, 31, something in her early 30s. And she has been trying to write her dissertation for Stanford, Stanford Anthropology. And she's found, she's made some hypothesis about hunter gatherers. And then she finds that like there are no hunter gatherers because, because of the invasion of, of Western and American foodstuffs, uh, even in like the remotest villages. Um, so she's like, I, I had a busted dissertation on my hands, um, but she doesn't want to like go back to the United States because among other reasons, she's gonna have to see her mother. She doesn't want to see her mother. Her mother sort of pops up like very sporadically in cute moments throughout the book. Um, and she's like, Oh, but there are lots of rich white people in Botswana here for various reasons, diplomatic NGO type reasons. And they're always like looking to give someone who's who's like wayward in, in the community like a help. So they let her like house sit and stuff. So she's not really doing anything, right? And she, in this sort of vacuum where she's not doing anything, she's like, oh, I need a companion, which is a classic thing that all people experience, right? Like everyone is like, oh, I have nothing. I have nothing in my life, therefore I must find love, or I'm going to devote myself entirely to my relationship so that I don't have to focus on my stressful career uh, or my sort of career failings or what have you. Um, but what's interesting, I think if you think about the whole novel, including the end, by the end, you can make this interpretation, which is that Danoon has his project. So she, she goes from, she has this realization and then she goes to a talk that Danoon is giving and his wife, is there, but they're like about to break up or his girl, I think she's his wife. Um, and he's giving this long talk. Uh, and then the narrator is, who's unnamed in this book, but we learned her name in um, Mortals and then the next book that Norman Rush writes. But she she goes to this talk and it's quite boring and people are sort of like against him. He's giving a Marxist, is it, is it Marx? He's Marx, he's like giving a Marxist. Is it sort, sort of, the, the textures of Marxism and socialism are quite, rich in the novel uh and you have to be quite specific about them which i'm not capable of doing right now uh and she just becomes like she's like i must have him so she like <laughs> does her scheme and she can see that the, the other relationship is on the rocks and so she just like sort of truly machinates she uses the term machinations machinating a lot uh machinates to get him and she sort of makes this her project right getting him and she wants to theoretically be his intellectual lover, but support him in his project, which is creating this matriarchal uh, utopian community, Sao in the middle of the desert. Um, so there's an interesting parallels in lots of different ways, which is that his project is kind of self-elimination because he, but he hasn't really thought about this yet because theoretically when his matriarchal community is complete, uh, he, the patriarch theoretically, Will, will subtract himself and have to leave because he's not only a white man, he's also, he's not, he's not just a man, he's white. Um, and the community that he's building is all sort of, um, uh, you know, obviously like people, like women from local villages, women who, who have been sort of banned by their families, poor women, whatever. Um, so, but, but he's like putting that off. And then she, uh, the narrator comes in and she's like, Ah, I will make it my project to get this man to fall in love with me and to need me, uh, but I still will like be an intellectual. And how she does that is she writes this novel afterwards, right? Um, so actually, it's a it's it's a tr it's a true pro like a, a a classic like female problem, which is like being obsessed with man when when the man is like obsessed with his work or whatever. But as we see throughout the book, like there are lots of kind of twists and like tensions with this uh, setup that. Are really interesting both in terms of like the plot development and in terms of feminism and any argument about the relationship between men and women the narrator and the framing of it because like she is this highly intellectual narrator in in person and the way that that norman rush is like is rooting the novel in her perspective and like i guess my question for you is how much of like delusion do you think or how much of nelson de noon do you think is like true from the perspective of our narrator like how much is she being deluded by him or like what is actually playing out um like do you have any thoughts on that 
Well, I think what's funny, I had a lot of conversations about this, particularly um, when we're on the dance floor in the morning, which is like the guys I had read it, it was mostly guys that were reading it, um, were like, yeah, but she's way better than he is. Like he kind of, he, he, she's built him up, but she's actually the star. And that is sort of realized by the end of the book, um, by what happens at the end of the book. But also, like, she she wants to dedicate this effort to him. And she sort of sees herself, like, when she succeeds, like, when she crosses the desert, right? This, like, amazing scene where she's crossing the desert. She loses one of her donkeys. Like, she, like, she, she starts hallucinating quite early on. She, like, you know, it's amazing. She crosses the desert. She manages it. And at the end of it, she's like, I cannot believe I did that. How stupid. But also, I'm so proud that I did that because most women could not and would not, right? So it's like you know she's leaving it all in the field like she's really like making she's really like demonstrating her her like true value and sort of Nelson like again again it's not that he's he lacks value right like it's not like oh he's a complete fraud right it's just that she has decided to become obsessed with him and to put all of her effort into him therefore of course he's not going to live up but on the flip side we know that this novel is based on um, the character, the narrator character is based on Norman Rush's wife, Elsa. Uh, and he has said in interviews uh, that he basically like, sh like lift straight, straight, she's a straight lift from life. Uh, and he just sort of put Elsa in a different situation than she was in when they, they lived as a couple in Botswana. I think there's a suggestion in this long interview that he did with the Paris Review, I think in 2010, that like he wrote this novel out of, great empathy or sympathy with Elsa who had to suffer him writing all of these sort of like like stupidly like niche socialist works and like kind of bad uh, political novels and things like this and he's like obsessed with socialism um and she was like raising their child or maybe two I don't know how many children they had and like doing other stuff uh and he sort of you can kind of read the novel and the interview suggests that you should or could read it this way as like a mea culpa by Norman Rush, which is like, I'm actually on Elsa. Like Elsa's actually better. She was actually more right. And like being obsessed with socialism uh, is like a doomed, um, a doomed project <laughs> in some ways. So your, well, your original question was, is he like not as good as she thinks he is? Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess I'm kind of hinting at the ending so we can just like get into it. But, um, you know, she he ends up having this like potentially religious experience when he gets lost in the desert near the end of the book and kind of changes him. Um, but then right at the end, she gets this note and it kind of makes her question and like raise the possibility of going back to him. Um, and that kind of. I guess twist ending reminded me of fake accounts in a lot of ways. Um, and so I just I don't know. It's interesting to me, like given the narrator's intelligence and given like now what I know about him basing on his wife and all of this stuff, like, I think it's interesting how you also chimed in on like the mom and what, how her mom is kind of factoring in here. And it makes me wonder, like, given her crossing like the desert to find this man and like only seeing her perspective of who he is. And then by the end, like that kind of question of what she's going to do about him made me wonder like, yeah, is she like deluded in a sense or like, what is, what is that ending kind of indicating? I don't know. That's a very rambly yeah. response to that. Well, I think the ending is like so fascinating. And also, so so I'm going to describe it a little bit in more detail because the, the details of what happens are very important. And I think the way that the narrator has throughout been sort of resisting uh, being a pathetic woman, right? She talks about sort of, she's like, I'm not like a pathetic woman in love. I am an active agent in my own romantic fate and like so be it if I want to have babies with this man like I'm still an intellectual look what I've done and so part of the project she's not writing a novel she's taking anthropological field notes the entire time so she often mentions her notebook and the notes she's taking and how she can't take notes there's a very funny scene where there's a sort of um a, a town meeting in Sao and there's a, there's a rival faction of people trying to like kick Nelson out and one of them is like why is she always writing take her book uh which is quite um uh sort of symbolic in a, a kind of rare way this novel another thing about the novel it makes it sort of like or, it feels like a novel is that it's not like 
it's not experimental. Like there's not like a ton of subtext that you need to be like understanding. Um, like the complication is on, on the level of the characters and the prose style. But anyway, so the end of the book, uh, basically there's like an uprising in the town and the women of Sao are like, what's this guy doing here? I should say also one of the machinations that the narrator makes, the calculations he makes when she comes there without being invited is that he's the solo man, uh, like mayor, let's say, of this uh, women's colony. And surely if he had a female mate, um, it might sort of uh, make things easier if, you know, for sort of cohesion between this, the, the, the Nelson and the, and the women. So um, she she's there and she sort of talks, she, 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 becomes, she writes a woman, she can like do a lot of heavy, like hard labor. Uh, so they like her. Um, and she can see that Nelson is sort of on his back foot, like they're starting to turn against him, this like faction in, in the in the colonies sort of turning against him. And something happens, it's like not really important, but, but basically like he has to go into the desert to sort of deal with this, this uh, rebellious group, I think. And she wants to stop him, right? She's like, I want to stop. This is a bad idea. He should not do this. But she says, she uses, in fact, an example from Marx's socialist history. Uh, I can't remember. But she's like, I am not going to be the woman, like, standing behind him, like, waving a shirt, right? Like, I'm not going to, like, begging him not to go. Like, I'm not going to do that. Of course, she's right. He's gone for, like, days and days and days. She's, like, really freaked out. She's trying to get people to go into the desert and find him. Finally, they do, do go into the desert and find him. And he's like, he's like under like a, I can't remember he's he's basically like swarmed by bees or wasps and like what happened he's like he almost dies it's amazing he survived um and they drag him back to camp and it's, <laughs> and what happens is the absolute worst possible thing which is the situation his sort of religious quasi-religious experience so he says in the desert when he's like delirious uh, because he's been in the desert for nine days. Also, it's like day two that he fails, right? Like he's been lying in the desert for nine days and because on day two, he like breaks his leg or something. I can't quite remember what happens. Um, so he goes to the, the, the women are taking care of him. He's like in a kind of hospital type area. The, it's the narrator's worst nightmare because what happens is he, be, he doesn't want to speak to her, but he apparently tells a lot of the other women what happened and will speak to them quite freely. And she is relegated to like a horrible role which is like the woman begging the man to like open up and be vulnerable and she just wants to know what hap like happened to him and like what he's describing and how does he feel and all the stuff she wants to take care of him but she hates this she really really hates this and she's like you know what we have to go um to the city and like get him actual medical treatment so they go to the city and he still won't talk to her and she's like furious with herself but she can't help herself from like basically like not nagging him because it's more than that but it's like why won't you talk to me sort of like she's demanding that he like open up to her and they have had this intellectual relationship where they talk and 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 now that's over and this like very significant thing has happened to him and he refuses to speak to her uh and this is sort of this interpretation is sort of like cemented for me when she's like out there out in the garden she gets up and she goes in to like get water or something and he's like you have your period all over your skirt so she's like literally like becoming becoming like her worst like female like the version of like the sort of pathetic woman covered in her own period period blood while she's like desperately trying to get this man to talk to her. Um, but what she does uh, with these feelings is she's like, I failed. Like I tried really hard. Like I failed. This is horrible. And she goes to like a bookstore in the mall, <laughs> and she sees like a young Swedish like beautiful skinny uh like i don't know she might work in an ngo or she might be a grad student she's, she's like some, some kind of young um like subordinate type job and she's reading i believe she's reading or reading something that cites or actually reading like Danoon's book in the in the mall am i right are you am i crazy yes she's reading Danoon's. yep <laughs> yeah okay so so the narrator goes up to her and it's like okay she's like okay here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw Danoon a party, 
which is his worst nightmare. He absolutely doesn't want this. It's going to be a very fancy, like glamorous party. And I'm going to invite this girl and like deliver her to him. And that's what she does. And it's hilarious because of course, like the traditional silent man hates fucking socializing. And he hates when his wife is like, I want to throw a party. Um, and then she's like, fine, take this young specimen, have like a true, like make her, keep her as your sort of like subordinate passive girlfriend and she like leaves Botswana but then amazingly she becomes like a feminist hero in California and she's like asked to like give lectures and stuff and this is like in the epilogue where she's you sort of learn how all of this how the novel came together and why she's telling you all of this um and she's like the lesbians love me because they think I'm like asexual or lesbian or something and she's like I'm just too depressed I just don't care or whatever and I think maybe gets a job I don't know but she becomes a feminist hero and they kind me blah 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 and she's like I don't I don't care about this you know like I'm bummed like I miss the exciting glamour of my old life uh and then she gets a call and this is the amazing thing and I believe the call is from one of the women from Sao. It's not from Nelson himself. Right. But she, the, the woman is like her friend and was always on their side. And the woman leaves a message with the secretary in a department or something. Like she leaves a message to somebody. And the, this person is like, hey, you have a message. And the message is like, whatever, this Swedish girl lasted a week. Everything's like gone horribly wrong. Like come back. And at the very end of the novel, uh the narrator is like you know I could keep it all here but I you know want to go back because actually that's her project right like she doesn't care about, she doesn't care about the academic work um she like you know she she wants to go back right um so yeah that's what that's the thing that's amazing but there are a couple of things about this right so she usurps to noon in a couple of ways first of all she could cross the desert by herself uh doesn't like crash and burn and break her leg or whatever within the first 48 hours of doing so uh, and the second is like she becomes like an academic star as well but she doesn't care like those are not the things that she wants right the thing that she wants is the noon or this intellectual love right this like truly equal like balanced partnership um and that is i guess the root of like a lot of these complaints about heterosexuality now right it, which is an honest well i think there's a way in which like contemporary feminism like girl boss stuff right it's like women can do everything men can do women want like the same thing like women want to be ceos and like da 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 da, da, da. and i think that what's comforting about this is that it's a, a woman who's like yeah i'm fantastic but the thing that i want is like a a mutual partnership with a man that I love right and that's impossible because he is still more obsessed with his project than he is with her right um so I think that's why it's actually resonating and that's why the ending is so amazing um because it is her doing what she actually wants um and not like I don't know what the heart wants what it wants right <laughs> and, and there is a way in which like the Botswana um like utopian colony life is like much more exciting and intellectually stimulating than like academic life in California <laughs> right so there's a quote from from Rush where he talks about like what the book is doing and he says like I want uh I guess what I want to say is that people should look at mating as the account of an experiment and that was really interesting to me in terms of like considering what the narrator wants and it's Danoon at the end of the day over these other things um despite her like initial pursuit of intellect like on her own um and my my question for you ties to you and your work um you know as an inspiration for fake accounts but also for your David Foster Wallace piece and my question, I was trying to think about how to frame this <laughs> in the right way, but I think it's interesting, like, in that piece, I'm obsessed with the polyamory, like, boyfriend one and boyfriend two framework of that piece. And it reminded me so much of mating while reading it because of, like, that framing of love kind of under, as an undercurrent. Was mating an inspiration for that piece in particular? And how do you think about, like, love as a framework in your, in your writing? Yeah, well, I think mating... I reread mating, I think like while I was doing a final edits of that piece. Um, and I think like the reason that I wanted to write a novel was I always want to write about relationships and love and I feel quite motivated by love. Um, 
and I think that, of course, people have, novels have always written about love, right? Like male novels write about it too. It's not a female um, subject, but it's sort of seen as like a female subject, right? Uh, and the thing I don't, it's I don't really want to write like in detail the way that I think a good novel requires about my actual personal life. Um, and so the thing about the Goop Cruise, David Foster Wallace piece that you're talking about is that like, I sketch that, I give you like enough details and I do it in that kind of like blunt, like quite modern way. Um, but you actually don't know very much about what's going on. Um, but you know that it's very important to me and that it is in fact, more interesting to me than this project that I begin right and I think I say like oh even though this is like the assignment of a lifetime like I'm gonna like write a great piece of magazine journalism and do all this stuff like I would have been rather with my boyfriend right um because we were having all this like ter romantic turmoil and I think that that is like an honest um and sort of like interesting tension particularly if you're a feminist writer uh because the t the thing that she feel like the thing that the narrator of mating feels um throughout the book is like is this stupid but i'm so like i'm doing it so well like it, maybe it wouldn't be so stupid if everyone was doing it with the like verb that i that i bring to it right um because i think like uh, you want like a balance. Was I thinking about mate? I think I was like, I, I, think I must have been thinking about mating because I was like, I need to reread this. I need to reread this. And I was like recommending it to everybody. So yes, but I don't, it's not like, a, I think there, there's like a way of interpreting these comments, which like if Twitter were so popular, like uncharitable people would listen to this podcast and they would sort of like twist my words and they'd be like, she's advocating for like trad, trad wife, blah, 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 blah. Of course, that's not what it is. Um, and that's the other side of this, what makes mating such an attractive novel, I think, to women today, which is that she's not like a trad wife, except like she's, and she, you know, she's moved to this matriarchal colony. She has to do a lot of hard labor, which is like taking care of things. Um, but she's also like having these like very high level, as you say, intellectual discussions. Um, her vocabulary is incredible. She's hilarious. Um, and she can she's she can refer to you know everything and i think there's like the things that i love about writing and the reason why i'm like the, the reason why i'm like oh i need to have a career my career is important is because i need to make a living and be an independent person right like it's not like the money part or like the the prestige or the successes are like what are like so important it's like the love of language and wanting to make art right um so the love of language and wanting to make her is, is not incompatible with being obsessed with men and wanting to be in love all the time <laughs> right um and you know sometimes unfortunately like this sort of career like blah 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 that side is incompatible with like heterosexual love in many cases uh not just because like you get a great assignment you have to go on a vacation and you want to keep talking to your boyfriends um, but like, actually like a lot of men, like don't like successful women and that sort of stuff. So I'm not saying like, oh yeah, trad wife, like just like make your, make your husband babies and like brownies or whatever. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying like that there is attention and, you know, I think there are indeed even some men who are motivated by love and <laughs> not, not like, uh, career political, like legend, right? kind of round it out with this idea of this novel being written from a, a place of love in terms of like Norman Rush writing it for his wife. And I think it's just a really interesting framing of like why he's writing this this way. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess, you know, last question for you on this book. This was published in 1991. And I'm wondering like if this book was to be published like today or it's the talk around like resurgence of it. Like, do you think this book would be picked up by like a major publisher today? Like this feels like a, I don't know. It's just interesting to me that this was like a national book award winner it doesn't feel like it's in this right like it's the same texture of like what wins prizes now i'm just kind of curious what you think about i don't know where this kind of narrative falls today yeah i mean i think there's like the really superficial again really superficial criticisms of it that theoretically would prevent someone from buying it right which are one it's a novel from the perspective of the woman about being a woman 
uh, written by a man. And number two, it's about a novel that is set in Botswana, written by a white person, all about white people. Now, I think actually both of those criticisms are, again, superficial and generally lovely by people who have uh, quite obviously not read the novel, right? Because the novel is about <laughs> is about their relationship, this sort of inappropriate relationship of white people to Botswana, right? People in Botswana to Botswana, right? But it's incredibly well researched. Uh, and you can actually, as I said at the beginning of the podcast, learn a lot about Botswana in the late 20th century um, and uh, Africa in general uh, in the late 20th century, if you read this novel. It, it's, you know, it's critical of that, it's critical of the situation while acknowledging that the situation exists. And I think a big problem with contemporary fiction is that people are really afraid of being criticized for saying what is, right? And they would prefer to have this kind of fantastical approach. It's, like, it's, a, it's a fantastical approach, which is like, can't we have novels of like, like people being happy and like, you know, like can't we, can't the novels reflect the rea reality as we want it to be and that that's a political sort of act. Um, and I think, no, I think, I think denying reality is like a horrible political strategy on every level. And it also makes for terrible novels, right? Um, so yes, the fact is that there are white people in Africa who are there for various uh, who have various motives in being there often they're good intentioned they usually cause a lot of problems and they affect local economies significantly right uh and but when i say white people i mean white people from um like sort of europe and the united states and i think there may be some australians in there as well i can't remember um so it's just it's just how it is it's just how global affairs work and it's how they've worked for decades and decades. Um, and so to say like, <laughs> there's, al there's also another thing about contemporary fiction is that people will say like, oh, why would you publish this novel, which is by a white man, uh, when you could publish a novel uh, by an African woman, say, right? Like, and it's like, there's, it's a, a, a sort of scarcity, like a topic theme thematic scarcity model, which is I think like, how publishing has worked uh, for a long time, but I don't really think it works that way now. I think like the amount of the number of books that, <laughs> that are are bought um, and published every year is like quite large, and I I couldn't tell you if the book would be published in the way that it was by a, a big a major publishing house. I just like don't know. Uh, I would like to think so. Um, but if not, I'm sure that Kendall story at Catapult would publish it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, like, or New Directions would publish it. You know what I mean? Like someone like that would publish it. And like, that's unfortunate because it sounds like this book was edited uh, with a lot of care uh, and given some money maybe. Um, but, you know, it, it, that's the situation. Does that sound, does that sound crazy? <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. I mean, that was that was a question submitted by my friend Chad, who has been very excited about this um, about this oh, chat. Yeah. So I was I was so stoked yeah. to hear your thoughts on that. But thank you so much for joining me on this podcast today and like unpacking this novel. Because I will admit, like, I was deeply challenged by this book and like on many levels of just like I've never read a book like this before. Especially mm -hmm. just everything about it was kind of like unique to me. So it was I'm glad I had your critical insight <laughs> to unpack did it. You so thank you. But did you like it? You liked it, I, or I I really liked it. Yeah, it was um. It was quite, it was just like, I don't know, it was very long, but yes. that's not a fault, I don't think, but it, it was just something, I don't know, it just took me more time to read it than I, like a normal novel would have, but I think that's probably in the novels, a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Also, I, I don't know, you learn vocabulary words from it, uh, which is really nice. Um, but I can't think of any that I learned from, from it off the top of my head, but I made a list, I have a list on my phone, so. Yeah, pro forma okay. is what is the one that like always sticks in my head from this I book, love, but... she says pro forma all the time it's so great thank you so much for having me it's so fun i love talking about mating mm -hmm.